just getting all set up. There we go. So, jeez, <laughs> so I'm looking for where my share. Oh, there it is. All right. Well, that's not the one I intended to share, but oh well. You should be seeing these slides okay, I hope. Come on, you silly thing. There we go. Yes. How's that? <laughs> that should Perfect. be nice and big. All right. So, um, yeah, this is the, these slides are the presentation I actually delivered uh, about a month ago to the people at ADMDIA uh, on data literacy. As you know, I've been working on this data literacy project over the last number of months um, for them. Their interest is in following up on the uh, small pilot data literacy project that we did with them where they used the data ability survey in order to sample uh, data you know, data literacy capabilities in the forces. So I did a fairly extensive review of the subject and I'm not going to go into the method and the process of that, but if you have questions about that, I can answer that. Uh, this presents mostly the results and I'm going to try to keep it as brief as possible, but it's a fairly extensive slideshow. So, but I hope you find it interesting and do feel free to interrupt at any point with questions because uh, I have lots of answers. All right. So um, basically, uh, the analysis of data literacy breaks down into three overarching frameworks. First of all, what is data literacy itself, which I define in terms of a competency model or framework. Second, uh, how we assess or evaluate data literacy. And then third, how we uh, augment or improve data literacy capabilities, which I've just classified under what I call here a teaching framework. So we're going to begin with the competency model or framework. So uh, data literacy, as I'm sure is not surprising, uh, is defined in many different ways uh, by various authors. Um, basically, uh, data literacy is the ability to collect, manage, evaluate, and apply data in a critical manner. Uh, overall, this is kind of the approach that they've already taken uh, at DND. Um, and uh, generally, this breaks down into a set of skills or competencies. Here, we're looking at something from Risdale out of Dalhousie in 2015. They did this project at Dalhousie. They did a lot of work on it and then basically disbanded it all, so, which is really too bad because they did a lot of good work. Um, so they're not the only ones. We have uh, Annika Wolf and colleagues uh, from Open University um, defining it as the ability to ask and answer real world questions from data sets. Uh, we also have, um, and this is the Statistics Canada approach, data literacy being the ability to derive meaningful information from data. Um, so, in other words, to be able to understand information extracted from data, uh, summarized into simple statistics, etc. So, you can see the different emphases and the different flavors of what data literacy looks like. Um, Gartner calls it out as a new core competency uh, as part of a clear commitment to the organization and leadership valuing informa quote, information as a strategic asset. And that's going to lead to a discussion of individual and organizational data literacy skills, which I'll address in a bit. Um, Department Nash of National Defense has basically adopted this Data literacy includes the skills necessary to discover and access data, manipulate data, evaluate data quality, conduct analysis using data, interpret the results of analyses, and understand the ethics of using data. Um, and that's a pretty comprehensive definition, and that's probably the one that will work best given what we've seen uh, here. Um, what we see from these 
definitions are the following major themes. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, data literacy is a set of skills or competencies. There seems to be broad agreement about that. Secondly, the idea of deriving meaningful information from data. Now, this is a side discussion I could go into for a long time, but I won't here. Third, and significantly, the idea that there's a data life cycle or a data workflow, or I, I saw a paper today calling it a data journey, same sort of thing. Um, fourth, the complexity of data literacy skills for differing roles. And then finally, as I mentioned, data literacy as an individual or a corporate capacity. So some examples of the importance of data literacy and how it applies in the context we're talking about here. And again, it's, you know, uh, a national defense kind of context. Uh, here's the United States Navy performance to plan or P2P uh, improvement through metric reporting and data analysis techniques. So you see they're going through this thing, the step-by-step -step process to identify the data and feed that back into improving their own performance. They have things like the driver tree, which is, you know, the, the things that inform or push forward the data analysis and uh, the concept of the data dictionary, defining all the specific terms that are used in the exercise. Uh, but not just military. I mean, I considered health Steven, to be... can I ask a question? Yep. Can you go, go for back it. to the Navy slide? Yep. This seems to me to be like with the data dictionary, it seems to me to be a very structured approach. Yeah. Like, you know, like uh, the old days type of structured approach, pre-Google uh, days. What do you, is, that, is that true for, for the Navy approach? And is that true mm. in general? Or is there more uh, some uh, some approaches that are more loosey goosey machine learning ish yeah. uh the short answer is there are some approaches that are more loosey goosey machine learning ish um and in fact uh in one of the upcoming slides i, I talk about uh in terms of types of data uh, structured versus semi-structured versus unstructured data and all of those fall within the context of data literacy. But yeah, that's a really good point. This slide I should point out is uh, a combination of slides. Uh, I've joined three separate slides to create this one slide. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, so I considered health services to be an area of significant relevance to the military, obviously. Um, so, and there are e extensive examples of data management and use in healthcare. Uh, a lot of healthcare data management predates, you know, even our current interest in data literacy. And as an aside, same with banking. Uh, is that what I have here? No. Um, banking was another area um, that has a lot of work already done, banking and financial services, um, because obviously they've been working on this for decades. Uh, Data-wise, this was a, a project, and again, I considered it relevant to the current context, use, uh, talking about use, the use of data to support learning and assessment itself, so feeding data education back into data education. Uh, all three of these cases, and I could deduce many, many hundreds more, show the importance of data literacy in various facets affecting not just the military, but a wide range of uh, organizations and industries. Uh, what is data, though? Uh, you know, we'll begin there. Uh, the representation of facts as text, numbers, graphics, images, sound, or video kind of speaks to the wide variety of data. Uh, it can be pretty much anything, an object, variable, or piece of information that has the perceived capacity to be collected, stored, and identifiable. I could go off into semiotics and all of that here, but I won't. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but we, we do have the different types of data. Norm, as you mentioned, 
we can distinguish between different types uh, of structure, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, and mixed. And this is important because you don't want to have a, a data literacy plan that, for example, deals only with structured data, as can be the case. Um, also, there are different data types in terms of data velocity. velocity. Um, you know, it can be uh, a batch data, which you process at a specific time interview or interval, anywhere through to a stream of data, uh, like this stream that you're watching right now. Uh, there's also different formats. Seems obvious, but you know, there's a lot of literature out there that thinks of data only as numeric data. Uh, and I was thinking about this uh, even during the project we did with the uh, data abilities, the uh, objective tests that we did were all statistical tests, all dealing with data only as numeric data. But of course, there's this wide range of other possible types of data, articles, transcripts, images, graphs, etc. Um, the data model is a concept that's applied to data. Um, the data model comes from machine learning and beginning to apply statistical algorithms to learning problems. For example, how to play checkers. Brief aside, I used to know the people at the University of Alberta that built the world leading checkers program um, through two separate communities. I, anyhow, sorry. Um, so in machine learning, we have the, the checkers example here. The data model kind of tells us what the data represents and how the data works and how the different elements of data interact with each other. Uh, you know, and again, as an aside, this whole idea of a data model is something that I see lacking in quite a few discussions of data and data literacy. Even uh, the paper that I talked about today that talked about the data journey talks about discovering data, processing data, distributing data, never mentions the model or the interpretation of data. But I, I find that's a really important component. Um, as I mentioned earlier, data gets dealt with using data workflows. Uh, I have a few sample workflows that we can look at here. Here's the machine learning uh, engineering workflow. Uh, kind of two major steps. The first of all, the exploration and wrangling of the data, and then the, uh, the training and testing of the data model in order to produce uh, results, uh, you know, predictions, abstractions, whatever. A similar model, applies in uh, big data analytics. Uh, here again, we have the data from different data sources. Here, this is taking more of a data management approach. So we see the data warehouse, uh, which might include data or streams, could be a data lake, data pool, etc. Uh, then the, the actual transformation of the data, then the modeling of the data again, uh, including a step for model validation and then the actual use of the results for predictions, prescriptions, etc. Uh, GAIS, or GAIS, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's a major initiative in assessment and instruction and statistics education. They had quite a lot to say about data literacy, interestingly, mostly from a statistical perspective. But again, they're working with a kind of a model. What makes this model a bit different is they begin with the question and then collecting the data, analyzing the data and interpreting the results. Here, the model kind of comes after the analysis, which I find interesting. Uh, so data literacy thought of as a discipline can be subdivided uh, the actual report has quite a bit more detail on the subdivisions, but what I found uh, is that it breaks down into uh, approaches to data literacy derived from information literacy or from statistics or from critical thinking or from data management and even, you know, the, the social community approach to handling data and thinking of data. Um, 
as mentioned before, a lot of these data literacy initiatives are based around skills or competencies. So we have to stop and think about, well, what is a competency? Um, so with a rough and ready definition, there are sets of basic knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics that enable people at work to efficiently do their job tasks. Um, we could talk about that a lot, but you know, Again, I had to bracket and consider out of scope a lot of these questions of precisely how to define some of these terms. Uh, but this map is the list of competencies that I found uh, in the literature, in, in the sampling of the literature. You see them on the left-hand side. Everything from awareness, dispositions, ethics, standards, governance, etc., Across the top, I have 20 studies, including the Risdale study, including data abilities, including uh, the Open University study, etc., etc. I could have doubled this list fairly easily without a whole lot more work, but I decided to limit it to 20. You can kind of see the non-pattern there, right? Uh, one of the first conclusions is there is no real consensus about what counts as data literacy. You, know, you, you can't go out there and say, yeah, this is what people think is data literacy. But there are some generalizations we can draw from this data. So here are the same uh, competencies represented as bar graphs. Um, so you can see some competencies kind of stand out. Discovery and exploration, decision making, etc. So I identify these. So these are identified with the horizontal rows. So there's discovery, there's ethics, there's informed decision making, etc. Uh, row 13 is databilities. That was the... Uh, the uh, system that we used in the survey, the, the, the pilot survey, and uh, significantly, uh, they do not include data ethics, they do not include data governance or stewardship, and they do not include knowledge and use of systems or tools as among their data competencies. Although they do overlap in you know, these uh, various other areas. So I think that was a result that uh, National Defense was quite interested in. Um, we can also define data literacy, as I mentioned, in terms of individual or organizational data literacy. We could get that into even more fine greens of defining data literacy by team, division, or branch. Or we could define organizational literacy in terms of tools, employee skills, or procedures and mechanisms. I thought that was important to draw out because it's different for an organization to have data literacy capabilities than it is for an individual to have data literacy competencies. Note the words I'm using here, capabilities versus competencies. So, um, Looking at that, uh, so we have the organizational activities uh, and capabilities, just a representation of the previous slide, but in a different kind of diagram. Um, competencies, now coming back to competencies, again, the, the skills, related knowledge, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, to allow for the completion of a task or activity. Note the, the three-part division here, skills, knowledge, and attitude. That's something I saw reflected throughout the literature. Not always in these specific words, but we see this a lot, and I used that. Um, so to define data literacy both individually and on an organizational basis, uh, I kind of drew a parallel. So for individual, we have knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And organizational analogies would be definitions in place of knowledge, capacities in place of skills or competencies, and practices in place of attitudes. Now, I think that kind of captures the, the, the two dimensions of data literacy. So drawing that out a bit here so we can 
you know, we're, we're fairly familiar with what knowledge, skills, and attitudes are in the educational context. You know, for example, for data, visual, data visualization, we'd say, you know, they know visualization formats, they can create visualizations, they're comfortable working with visualizations. Well, on the organizational side, uh, you know, there would be, um, you know, standard visualizations for key data. Uh, the capacity, there would be a staff capacity to access and use data visualizations and you'd have that expertise on staff. And then in terms of practices, you'd have tools, you'd have the access to the tools, you'd make them part of the reports workflow, you'd actually use them. Uh, it'd be interesting, total aside, it'd be interesting to do an analysis of our organization in terms of, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the individual skills that are required of researchers, but what about the organizational skills? We, we don't talk about that, at least not at the researcher level, um, but I think that's a really important conversation to have. And I think that was one of the takeaways that D&D &D, uh, was really happy to see. Um, so how do we assess this? Uh, looked at a number of assessment programs, OECDs, uh, PISA assessments, and assessment for adult competencies um, is one example. I also looked at the uh, statistics um, guys, again, from this perspective of assessment. Also looked at uh, something called uh, the Data Literacy Imperative from Eckerson Group by Dave Wells, I thought was particularly well written and well thought out. Um, and I find that the, the data literacy model, well, no, let me, let me put this differently. Um, what I found was that it's important in assessment to base that assessment on some kind of structure or framework so that you know what it is that you're assessing um, and you know that you're assessing is assessing for what it is that you want to be assessing so what kind of model based assessment can we use for data literacy well for simplicity i just use bloom's taxonomy uh, again out of scope, all the discussions we can have on other models. People know Bloom's, and so I'll just use that for the sake of argument. Now, Bloom's taxonomy, as you know, goes beyond the cognitive assessment that everyone's familiar with, or the cognitive domain that everyone's familiar with. Uh, it also includes affective, and also includes psychomotor uh, competencies as well. Uh, you should be seeing, at least as I saw, knowledge, skills, and attitude in there, right? Knowledge, cognitive, skills, psychomotor, attitude, effective. So I thought that was a, a useful correlation. I could use that as a structure. Again, just a structure, right? Not a statement about the nature of the world or how mind is functions or anything like that. Just a structure so that we can hang our assessments off of something. So, okay, um, looking at the assessment of data literacy, therefore, uh, using Bloom's, we can look at the individual and organizational domains for data literacy, which I talked about in a previous section. So how does that cash out? Uh, well, um, let's look at the knowledge domain first of all, right? We can look at individual knowledge, comprehension, application, etc. Also the organizational, and I won't go through all of these, uh, you can review them, but you know, just the different ways uh, the knowledge of data is articulated as an individual competency or as an organizational capability. Similarly, with skills and competencies, um, these are the actual capacities. Now I, I've added a wee bit to Bloom's just to, to for completeness, uh, again, just because it's a structure or a framework. And again, we can map this, you know, so that, for example, individual adaptation, uh, can they create data visualizations or data stories, which was among the skills that we saw represented in the skills list. Um, organiz organizationally, do you actually use visualizations and data stories? 
right? Because it doesn't matter if you can create them if you never use them. Similarly, with respect to attitudes, right? Is the individual open to learning from data? Organizationally, the analogy would be data is welcomed and sought after, etc. Framing. Uh, is the person willing to work in a data-centered way as opposed to, for example, an experience-centered way or an anecdotal-centered way um, or as I once talked about management by rumor, a rumor-centered way. Similarly, in organizationally, knowledge management is data-centered rather than, say, rumor-based. Um, so, in assessment, we see a lot of discussion of levels of achievement. Um, and they're all like, well, no, they're not all like this, but most of them are like this, where, you know, they talk about going from basic levels of literacy data, citizen, they call it here in Quantub, for example, moving all the way up to data scientist. Um, there are other levels and literacy scores, etc. I don't have nice pictures on this slide yet, but again, you know, from zero to five, this is your data literacy score. I found that not useful. Um, and so what I wanted to do is create a representation of a description of a, a result of an assessment that isn't a simple six stage level. So what I did, uh, I took the analysis from the, you know, the blooms that we just did um, with the different competencies or the different capabilities. I added to that actual descriptions from the forces career section. And as a result, you can get what I call a data literacy skills profile, which uh, creates a spider chart or a radar chart. This would describe uh, both the skills profile for an individual position based on the position description or it could describe a skills profile for an individual based on an individual assessment and then of course you could map the two together to see how closely a person their skills fit the position that they're in. That would produce the gap or, you know, and, and indicate the need for training. This diagram here is an example only. Uh, it's not an actual diagram of any measurements I actually took. It represents how the measurements would be conducted in a full-fledged data literacy study. Um, assessment methods uh, looked at the different types of methods described in the literature, self-report, skills test, um, both multiple choice and open response, and then analysis. Uh, most of the discussion is on the first three, obviously, because that's what are used in the educational system. But uh, there's this fourth domain, which uh, really opens a wide range of possible assessments that don't look like, you know, uh, a college test or, a, you know, exam. Um, so the methods, self-reporting, I found a bunch of them in the literature. This was a, a cute one, um, although the, the JavaScript was slow and unpredictable, but it's a self-assessment where you go through, you know, basic elements of data, data storage methods, etc. Uh, attitude, skills, knowledge. Hmm. Uh, and you know, you assess your proficiency by clicking on the slider, the importance by clicking on the slider. It crunches that number and then puts you on this talent development grid. I thought that was pretty interesting, although it's a self-report, right? Um, here's another example um, from the uh, School of Public Service. How data literates are you? Now, the thing with self-reporting, now, in our analysis, the, the, the pilot testing that we did, we did use self-reporting. That's what DataBilities does. We also used a series of what we called objective questions, which were the statistical questions that I mentioned earlier. And 
we found, at least my recollection of it is this, that there was a correlation, right? I mean, the self-reports did correlate with the, self, uh, with the objective tests. But uh, uh, during this, I read a paper called The Dunning-Kruger Effect is Autocorrelation. And the same mathematics in that paper map to our study. Uh, in other words, our self-report, call that X, uh, the objective test, we're looking at not simply what they got on the objective test, but the difference between the self-report and the objective test. So, in other words, X minus Y, so that produces Z. So now if we graph this X versus Z, we're actually graphing X on this side and X on this side, in a sense, which is going to produce a gradient every time. That's what that paper describes. That's probably what we did in this report. So I still come back to other arguments to say that the self-reporting uh, cannot be shown to map to uh, actual capabilities, either in a positive sense, we're honest about them, or in a negative sense, Dunning-Kruger effect where we overstate our own abilities. Uh, so looking at skills tests, there are two types. The open response, um, which I think people consider to be the most accurate, but the most difficult to assess because just the overhead of actually you know, interpreting and grading the responses to an open response. So obviously, uh, the, the assessment needs to be based on something like a rubric. Um, you know, there are AI essay graders. You can get this overhead down. Um, but, you know, again, we come back to our data models and, you know, are we actually describing correctly what it is that we're assessing? Still, uh, certainly doable. Um, the alternative that many uh, choose instead is the multiple choice. Um, the multiple choice, there, there are methods, for example, the, ra the method using rash modeling to create multiple choice skills tests that map to the skills that you want to assess. And remember at the beginning of the section, we talked about, you know, having this model, the skills that we want to assess to make sure we're assessing what we want to assess. When we get to the multiple choice, this is the mechanism for making sure that we're assessing what we want to assess. Tell me if I'm saying assess too many times. Um, so this is an example of, uh, a multiple choice test actually out there. Just as an aside, some of these slides that look really unprepared did not actually exist in the presentation that I gave to ADMDIA. I put them in the slide uh, presentation after that presentation to remind myself that they exist while I was writing the actual report. So uh, the third method or the fourth method is analysis. Uh, this is where you take something else that they've done unrelated that wasn't a test or anything like that and you run an analysis against it and look for indications of data literacy. Uh, it's really similar to the sorts of analyses, the content analyses that researchers have done, for example, on text chats or, or discussion boards or things like that, looking for meaning, looking for the use of certain argumentation, looking for emotions, etc. In this case, you're doing an analysis looking for indicators of data literacy. Finally, mixed methods, uh, for example, some multiple choice with some open-ended questions, etc. Uh, important to consider, and again, out of scope for this, but I wanted to mention it, uh, the need to ensure both reliability and validity of the assessment to make sure that uh, you are measuring what you want to measure. There are mechanisms for this and I mentioned a number of them in the report. Leads us finally to teaching framework. 
So we come back to what do we want to teach? These are the things that we want to teach. Why? Because these are the things that we're assessing. Why? Because these are the data literacy competencies and capabilities that flow from our definition and the research. So uh, I looked at a variety of things. Um, basically, I broke this section down into data literacy programs then individual teaching and learning methods, and then finally a sampling of individual learning resources. So programs, um, so this is one from uh, uh, Burson, Deloitte, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, some, uh, you know, models and designs for data literacy program development. So, uh, you know, in other words, frameworks that you can use to create your own data literacy program or alternatively the other side type of example are actually existing data literacy training programs so some models here's a roadmap uh, from quant hub uh, it's pretty standard kind of you know here's how we create instruction kind of model you create your data vision and roadmap which is the structure that we've done already create the vision and then design a plan with goals and then practice, deliver, assess, practice, deliver, assess, etc. Uh, this is from Wells. Again, you're defining the knowledge, develop your learning resources, identify your participants, set your targets, practice, deliver, assess, practice, deliver, assess, etc. Similarly, the uh, data literacy imperative, again, uh, still from Els, uh, Wells, rather, uh, you know, uh, plan, execute, measure, assess, plan, execute, measure, assess, etc. This iterative process, the single loop and double loop, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, a few other things that I threw in here. This is, again, one of these slides I added after. Uh, the Data Literacy Project talks about this. Um, not to be confused with the dataliteracyproject.org, which is a thing that still exists and isn't the same as the original Data Literacy Project. Uh, things that exist, uh, the UNESCO Digital Literacy Global Framework. Uh, I wanted to mention this in the study because although it's not data literacy, it does give you a really good example of an overall literacy framework with the, with the assessment and the, the skills development all included. Um, also, OECD on skills development. Again, they've mapped out this process uh, it's not focused on data literacy, but it does talk about dealing with stakeholders. It does talk about the different things that you need to set up. Again, we have this knowledge, skills, and attitudes triad at play here. Um, now, teaching and learning methods. Um, again, uh, breaks down to pedagogical methods to teach or support data literacy training, and then specific trials of different methods. Uh, which is what 90% of the academic papers were, right? Uh, which I found interesting, right? They very rarely do they deal with this overarching topic. They, they're, they're all very focused. We tried this method in this learning context with 45 students in a Midwestern university, or as it turns out, in a lot of the cases, it was Indonesian universities. I don't know why, but Indonesia was big on this. Uh, so... Um, again, we, we come back to, for teaching methods, the uh, guidelines for assessment and instruction in statistics education. Uh, so instead of saying statistical here, substitute the word data literacy. Um, so teach data literacy thinking, right? Teaching it as an investigative process of problem solving and decision making, giving them experience, focusing on conceptual understanding, etc. Um, but active learning, exploring concepts, and analyzing data. These were pretty much in common with the recommendations from various sources, a number of sources that I looked at. Um, 
This was an example uh, that was tried in one of these individual papers uh, called Data Storming, where they used paper-based uh, models to get people to think about how to create designs using data. Uh, kind of neat. Uh, another hands-on method were statistics or simulations rather and interactive technologies. Tinker plots was something that was studied in this particular case. Uh, another method, code-based teach or sorry, case-based teaching method. Of course, there's a whole domain of case-based teaching methods. Uh, what we like about it is that it's focused on actual or as close to actual as possible instances where data literacy and data literacy competencies are required. Um, this was something that came up quite a bit using affordances in real world data, actually using real data in order to practice and develop data literacy skills. And so here we have, uh, you know, uh, based on the teaching for statistical literacy hierarchy, um, again, it's in the list of competencies, etc., uh, using real world data. Um, another method literacy data driven decisions. So, uh, in this case, it's from uh, a data literacy instructional context. So, you present the students with the data um, and then uh, use that data to identify, in this case, the target skill that you're trying to uh, teach them, identify a strategy, implement that strategy, and then collect data again. Um, finally, to wrap up, and you know, the presentation kind of tails off because we've made all of our main points, various resources that are out there. There's tons of resources, believe it or not, already on data literacy uh, related topics. So a few of the key ones, lessons and lesson plans, help sheets, courses, and performance support tools. So here are some examples of lessons. Again, I mentioned the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and there's a ton of stuff from the financial uh, sector on data literacy. The data visualization project I thought was a pretty interesting example of data literacy resources. It's a set of common data visualization techniques. Data analysis worksheet. It is what it says it is. It's a data analysis worksheet. Um, Statistics Canada has a range of data literacy training projects. Um, but uh, their videos, basically, their training videos, and that's what it is. Um, similarly, I saw courses out there, uh, such as subscription-based data literacy courses. Courses are videos. They're video courses. Um, E-Learning Curve has a course library. Uh, these are standard LMS-style courses. You can see all the, the contents on the left-hand side nifty little diagrams and an audio track on the right now yeah their videos um performance support uh there is some performance support built into some systems this is a slide that came in after the presentation but i, I really feel ibm's cognos should be mentioned uh as well as uh something called qlick um and that was it that that's the overview of data literacy. So anyhow, I presented it to them uh, and then did the report based on this. They're pretty happy with this. Uh, it does provide the comprehensive overview of data literacy that they were looking for. At least that's the feedback that I got. And uh, yeah, there's a lot out there, but it's still a new area. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of stuff done on it in the future. So that's the talk and questions, comments, anything? Still with me? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Stephen. You did an extensive coverage of the topic. I mean, it's amazing the quantity of stuff you you, you gathered together and uh, were able to present in the synthetic way. So uh, I like that. Uh, I like that. Uh, it's, uh, 
it's a broad topic, uh, yeah. as you mentioned, and uh, uh, for sure you can dig maybe deep, you can dive maybe deeper on some aspect of it or other ones, but that's a, an overview and an extensive one that you presented this morning uh, and for D&D too. So, uh, thank you very much. Questions, comments, uh, anyone? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Oh, Bruno, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, what are they doing? What's, what's the point of this activity at D&D? &D? What are they trying to accomplish? So, um, right now, they're going to, uh, as to use their specific word, uh, they're going to socialize this report, which means that uh, they're going to make, uh, you know, the upper levels of the command structure aware that, you know, when they're talking about data literacy, these are the points to consider, these are the things to talk about. They want to, they, they have a very clear plan to uh, promote data literacy in the forces and to ensure that, uh, you know, there are certain levels of capability uh, for fairly obvious reasons, I think. Uh, you know, it's, the example, I, I didn't use it with them, but I'll use it here. Um, that video that uh, Valensky, allegedly having Valensky telling his troops to surrender, right? Uh, this is a data literacy thing, right? Where you don't want to be fooled by a fake video like that. Uh, this kind of capability is the sort of capability that they need in the forces to be able to analyze, use, uh, manage, and interpret data. And they need to be able to do that in the field without re relying on a centralized authority to tell them how to understand this data it's a, you know it's an operational capacity and so that's that's the information that needs to be taken back to their command so that they know that and once they know that uh, then of course there are suggestions in here about how to assess their current status of readiness and how to promote data literacy so that's my take on what they're going to do with this And, and Bruno could probably comment on that too, because he was involved with the uh, original data literacy, data literacy project. Yeah, well, he said one, one of the questions I had was uh, your assessment of the data abilities. And mm. um, uh, I'm not sure that is, uh, I, I have the little graph I did of the, um, of the topics they, they actually covered. So yeah. it's uh, divided in three major areas analytics and evaluation which is you know looking at graphs and being able to mm -hmm. uh, make judgments there is a data concept and culture and yeah. data collection and management um i'm not sure about the stewardship that you, you say for example it doesn't deal at all with stewardship because it looks like the whole data abilities is about um this aspect as you move along and you you get uh, um, assessed as more um, uh, data literate it's because you're more able to teach someone so I mean the whole scale is based on I need assessment guidance to I need to tell people or help people to do their task so uh, I'm not sure that's you know saying that there's no stewardship in their abilities a little bit short um, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, more subtle, I guess. It's embedded in the in the uh, uh, overall assessment and ranking rather than specifically a uh, question about that. But um, overall, I, I, I totally agree with Jean-Francois. It's an extensive work of uh, coverage of, uh, of different uh, uh, approaches to this problem. Um, what we did was, was fairly narrow. We were trying to mm -hmm. assess if data abilities uh, was a, a good tool for assessment by combining with objective measures and also a, a, the BIRD uh, um, BIDR uh, yeah. survey that uh, measures people self augmentation <laughs> uh, tendency and how it would affect uh, self assessments and things. But, uh, I'd say that uh, overall data abilities didn't die on the operating table. <laughs> Um, so I, I would probably disagree with you about the stewardship. Um, 
because the stewardship deals with uh like you know what would you do if you were a curator uh with data um mm-hmm. you know uh, handling things like data provenance uh data handling mechanisms uh things like that um and i i didn't see that aspect in the data abilities yeah. But yeah, yeah, again, you know, there there are questions about the uh, use of metadata, mm-hmm. applied standard procedures, mm-hmm. apply security and ethics, uh, uh, apply, uh, you know, well, that's sort of low level data management, mm-hmm. but identify trustworthy data. Uh, anyhow, I mean, it's it's fairly soft as a as as an assessment, yeah. as as we all agreed when we engage in yeah. this study, but. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a huge commitment yeah. across the government of Canada to that yeah. to that tool. So, yeah, um, I mean, if we look, I mean, to me, the 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 key diagram there is the one with the orange stripes across it, right? Yeah. And if we look at that, there's a large degree of overlap between data data abilities and what the consensus is in the field. You know, overlap, not one hundred percent. And you know, uh, the 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 key thing, like like you mentioned, data ethics. But the key thing here is like, uh, d- data abilities doesn't deal clearly with data ethics, um, and and so that was one that that David Minier in particular uh, drew out and, and said, yeah, this is one we had already talked about. Uh, but again, a lot of these categorizations, a lot of these classifications are stipulative. Um, and, you know, I'll be the first to say this, right? Uh, you know, and this goes for all 20 of the assessments, not just data abilities. Uh, I read through them and I asked myself the question, does this study include this competency as one of the competencies? Right. Generally, they listed them, but, you know, across 20 studies, they're not all using the same terminology even. Um, so yeah. there, there were certainly a lot of judgment calls here, and I'd be the first to say that. No, okay, thanks. Stephen, can mm-hmm. I ask if you're going to come up with some uh, guidelines or recommendations on all of this uh, uh, information amassed for D&D that can be boiled down into uh, guidelines? I thought about that, and I actually decided against it um, because that wasn't the purpose. Um, what I wanted to do is give them a broad overview of what data literacy is, and so really, in, you know, like the in the paper, there's an executive summary. The executive summary is kind of focused on those five themes that emerged from the literature that I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation and then expands on those. And so I think those five themes are as close to what I would call recommendations. But I didn't want to make recommendations to them. Um, Just, you know, I could, but but, but I'm not, you know, I, I think... You know, with recommendations, you need to do two things. You need to have the knowledge of the discipline, which I think I've captured in this presentation, but you also need the situation, uh, situational knowledge in the forces themselves, of the forces themselves. And I'm not in a position to do that. You know, uh, I just don't know enough about the forces context to say what would work best for them. That's my feeling anyways. I'm sure they'll come back to yeah. you and want to extend the project for that phase, yeah. right? I've I've indicated a willingness to keep helping them both to do this socialization of the information process that they talked about and any further work. So, and and you know, assuming they're happy with this, and I see no reason why they wouldn't be, uh, they may well come back. Thanks again, uh, Stephen, for doing that. I mean, uh, it's needed at some point because, I mean, we need to have a big picture of, of the data literacy and uh, especially these days, nowadays. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it was uh, really interesting to me. Um, 
And sure. I learned, you know, because as you all know, I have all my theories and thoughts and feelings about education in general. And, you know, this basically took all those feelings and thoughts and theories in general and ran them through the washing machine, if you will. Just, you know, it doesn't show up in the report at all, but basically it took everything that I think about learning and, and put it to the test. And so I found this very educational. Um, and it's not coincidental that during the course of this project, I also wrote the uh, connectivism paper because it was kind of a rehashing of a lot of those things as well. So there was a meta level at which this was really, really interesting to me. There's only two minutes left. Maybe a, a last question uh, that I have. In terms of literacies, literacy itself, I mean, there's so many components to literacy and data literacy is one of them. Mm -hmm. Where does it stand in the scaffolding of the different literacies? Uh, well, of, <laughs> you, have uh, know, you have to know how to count and read and stuff like that before no. you do that analysis. And, all right. Visualization and, uh, Here's my theory in one minute. <laughs> um, all of these literacies are typically presented as skills and competencies and if you push them far enough as encoding decoding kinds of activities uh, for sense making and all of that by contrast i view them all as different ways of organizing and packaging types of pattern recognition so to me, underlying literacies generally are the basic competencies or skills in pattern recognition. And I describe those as critical literacies. Of course I would, right? And the critical literacies are, uh, you know, the, the recognition of structure, uh, the recognition of meaning, uh, recognition of use or application, recognition of context or environment, uh, recognition of inference, explanation or cognitive processes, and recognition of change, right? And, and I have these cached out in various places under the heading of data literacies. So if I was to try to put data literacy into that context, I'd now be thinking of how do these individual literacies map out against the critical literacy. So we go with like data visualization, right? With data visualization, now we could do the knowledge, skills, abilities thing, but I would map it to each of the six critical literacies and I'd be looking at, for example, um, you know, general principles of data visualization or uh, the the how data visualization different types of data visualization impact the value that you see in data or how do you use a data visualization to convince someone or how do you use data visualization in order to draw conclusions or make inferences or decision making it'd be like that so that's how so I you know there's this wide range well, think of a think of it as a graph, as uh, as as a table. Okay, along the side you have the six elements, right? Uh, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, context, uh, cognition, and change. And then rows down the top for each of the literacies. So language literacy, numeracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There isn't a hierarchy of literacies. They're all understood in terms of these six basic critical literacies. That's how I think of it. Yeah, I know. I have a, a, a graph that shows up in figure. Shows yeah. up, shows up that, uh, would be great. Uh, yeah, well, I have a whole paper I need to write on that one day. So I've been talking a bit with Doug Belshaw about it. And no, it's, it's in my list of things to do. My long uh, list of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm running out of career. <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> Excellent. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're past the hour already, so we have to, to, to uh, reach the end of this meeting. Uh, will you put your slides on the MS Teams uh, folder for, for the team? Or, I can uh, do that, yeah. Um, so, and I've also made a recording of this presentation. I don't know if you'll find that useful, but it does exist. And if anyone wants it, you can ask me for it. Um, it's probably too big to put on MS Teams. Yeah, no, for sure. But uh, the slides themselves would be useful uh, yep. as a starting point for, for all that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, see you later. Uh,